What's up, Navigating Academia family? I hope you are having a wonderful week so far. My name is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh, and it's a pleasure to be able to have you here on our channel. If this is your first time, warm, warm welcome to you. Please consider subscribing to the channel if you do enjoy our content. We release new original content every week. At the same time, if you're already subscribed, please do place a like below right now. It's totally free to you. Place a comment down below telling us if you like the video. It helps the YouTube algorithm. It helps the channel grow. We're still a relatively new channel. We got a solid growth rate right now. I want to keep that trajectory up. Don't take any money from the channel. Any money that does get made goes directly back into the channel in terms of new equipment and this kind of stuff to make even higher quality videos for you guys. Uh, and so, in thanks for my time. I really appreciate you guys liking this video. So let's go ahead and get right into it. I have a question today, which is a very difficult question to, to answer. It's a difficult question to even think about, uh, but you guys know that what's really important to me is to be as transparent as I conceivably can with you. There's so much misinformation that goes out around not only behavioral health as a field in general, but specifically graduate education when it comes to behavioral health. So it's important for me to tackle this topic and to discuss with you a little bit, and you'll see why it's relevant to me in a second, uh, but to discuss a little bit about my personal experiences related to this question uh, and also to reassure the individual who asked it. So let's go ahead and get into it. Here's the question. Could you possibly discuss the concern of sexism ageism, racism, ableism, etc. in grad schools. My cognitive psychology professor, who is Asian and female, spoke transparently of her experience. She also said that it was common for advisors to want young students who went straight through to earn their degrees right away. Finally, she mentioned that the culture around mental health paradoxically was not very supportive. Do you think this is the case in most programs? Or are there ways to detect this and steer clear of the few that are less empowering? This is a great series of questions. What I want to do is to try to tackle them overall and then each one in turn. So just stay with me on this, okay? Uh, so there's a lot of things going on here. So sexism, ageism, racism, ableism, and so forth, all right? So let me go ahead and break down my experiences, not only personally and anecdotally, but also just from the last 15 years of being an academic, what I have seen. Okay, so let, let's go through them. Sexism. I had a supervisor once uh, at a school that I won't name. Uh, I had a supervisor once who literally sat with me as close as I am to you right now, as close as I am to the camera, and said, there are too many women in science. And that is some bullshit. Uh, that is ridiculous to me that anybody in academia believes that uh, at all. Uh, I'm a huge believer in equality of, of, uh, of opportunity. I don't believe in equality of outcome, but I believe in equality of opportunity. Everyone should have an equal chance to be able to show the best that they've got. And if the best that you've got results in higher impact publications, uh, more opportunities for monetization, opportunities for keynote speeches at conferences. If your metrics are better, then your metrics are better. What can I say? Now, there's a lot of ways to play the game in academia. I can tell you that to be able to get ahead, uh, regardless of your, your sex, your gender, your race or ethnicity, so on and so forth, cultural background. Regardless of those things, there are ways to play the game. But at the same time, it is definitely something where you would think that that kind of sexism is gone, and I wish that I could tell you that that's the truth, but it's really not. I have definitely also sat in rooms where essentially people are discussing uh, who to hire uh, in academic settings, and basically people saying, oh, well, you know, that person is, is really quite young. They're probably at the age where they're, you know, like going to want to start a family and all. And, you know, if we end up hiring them, then it's, you know, one of these unfortunate situations where maybe, you know, they'll be gone for like a year or two years. And then we have to, you know, save their place for when they come back. And then, you know, the productivity of the department will get less. And if the productivity goes down, then maybe the department will lose funding or even the department will dissolve. Uh, and just to sit in these meetings and to hear these things, I got to be honest with you, is very discouraging, uh, for lack of any other term. It's very discouraging 
Now, it is obviously, like, biologically unfair that you can get guys like Mick Jagger in, like, you know, his 70s and 80s. He's still having a million kids uh, versus I have uh, some of my most valued colleagues who I have had, like, tearful conversations like them in tears on the phone to me talking to me about how they feel like, you know, you know, they're, uh, you know, entering their 40s and they, you know, don't have a partner yet and don't have children yet. And they just deeply, deeply desire that. But they've spent their 20s and 30s working their butts off and they're super successful working their butts off. But now they feel really lonely in these things. And they've always wanted kids and they feel like, you know, biological clock, biological clock, you know. Um, and, and it's one of these things where like, that is an unfair difference between uh, biological men, biological women, like for sure. Um, so it, it's certainly something that like, have I seen it? Yes. Is it a real thing? It for sure is. Okay. So that's sexism. Racism is something that I have for sure come across in my field of forensic psychology. There's no doubt about that. You know, it's one of these things where regardless of which group we're talking, if we're talking about sexism or racism, or racism, etc., there's always an in-group and an out-group. The in-group in psychology is no doubt Caucasians. It's just not a question. Now, I'm half white, my mom's white, and my dad is Indian, right? So I kind of don't fit in anywhere, right? That's been my whole life or whatever. You know, you never quite fit in no matter what the setting is. Uh, and also as somebody who spent about a third of his life living abroad, similar sort of a thing. You're not American enough for the Americans anymore, and you're not, you know, foreign enough for living in any of these foreign countries. Uh, but I can tell you that there have definitely been circumstances where I have experienced, like, straight up everybody else being invited to dinners and these sorts of things and then like you get left out or other people getting invited on papers and you're being left out or minority affair committees and like how they function even minority affairs committees can like have their own racial like intra-racial problems it's really weird uh, but it's something that like you do end up seeing it it is predominantly implicit and it's more prejudicial than it is discriminatory, but every now and again, discriminatory behaviors will definitely come up. And it's, again, extremely discouraging. So that's my take on racism. Ageism, that's something where, to be honest with you, that's the one that's flexible, right? And what, what do I mean by flexible? So here's the deal. Uh, the, the question that was asked here specifically is, uh, so her uh, colleague, her uh, mentor, psychology professor, said uh, she also said it was common for advisors to want young students who went straight through to earn their degrees right away. I don't know if that's particularly true. I definitely think that's the norm. I think that that's probably like 90% of people. The important thing, though, is that for folks who are, you know, more mature students, shall we say, so older students, if you want to get in, the most important thing is having a logical storyline between what you were doing between when you graduated undergrad uh, and when you actually are applying for the degree now. If you have a sensible storyline, and it's something where maybe when you look back on your life, like it was just kind of out of nowhere and there is no storyline. You have to really think about it. You are applying for this program for a reason. And by the way, if the reason is just, uh, I wanna help people and uh, this seemed cool or something like that, please don't apply, please. Right? There's got to be a story behind it that makes you really value this work, especially if you're, especially if you're applying for clinicals like PhD programs, you're really going to need the story. Uh, the, the odds of getting into those programs, I mean, I work one-on-one -on -one doing consultation appointments with individuals who want to get into those programs because it's more difficult than getting into med school in the United States. The rates of acceptance are so absurdly low. Now, the good news is I have a really high success rate of helping people, you know, develop their materials to the point where they get into programs, which is awesome, right? Uh, if you're interested in that, you know, contact me. It's, everything is paid. I used to do free consultation stuff. Then I had a million people writing to me and people missed meetings and it, they didn't appreciate it at all. So that doesn't make sense for me anymore, given the skill that I got with it. So in any case, though, I would love to work with you. I've got slots open right now, so you can go ahead and let me know. Uh, but it, it's one of these things where we're, we as graduate supervisors are used to people kind of coming, like just going straight through, right? Undergrad to grad school, right? But I definitely have a lot of colleagues who did not take that traditional path. Uh, it is something where, you know, you may have in that case a supervisor who is younger than you are, right? Like that's possible. And that could concern you. Like for me, I've definitely worked with students who are older than I am. I don't mind. I've run businesses where every person who worked for me, 100% of people who work for me are older than I am, right? It, it depends how you carry yourself, how you hold yourself. 
and just, you know, having that, that intrinsic value and in understanding your worth, right? Uh, and yes, it's definitely something where there may be supervisors who are intimidated by you because you're older and conceivably wiser in certain areas of life. So that is something to know about, but I wouldn't worry too much about ageism. The other thing, of course, is if you go to conferences and these sorts of things, people will probably assume that you're the supervisor, right? Uh, just age-wise, and you shouldn't be insulted by that. That's completely okay. I would argue that oftentimes it's a sign of respect. So anyway, that is what I have to say about ageism. Now, the next thing that was asked here is finally, she mentioned that the culture around mental health paradoxically was not very supportive. This is 100% a thing. All right, if you've watched my other videos, you know that when I've taken a look at the peer-reviewed research literature on the point prevalence of major depression and clinical anxieties, like generalized anxiety, any subform of anxiety, uh, that we're dealing with like mid 30% for men and mid 40% for women who are going through graduate school right now. Depression and anxiety is a legitimate problem. The number of people at Oxford when I was there who committed suicide was ridiculous. Right. And it's not OK, but it's one of these things where to me, it doesn't matter what I've done, uh, how many companies I've run, how many books I've published, anything like that. My time at Oxford was the most difficult years of my entire life. My entire life was that first doctorate. Second doctorate was way easier because I knew what I was doing. First doctorate. Whoa. Like that was the biggest shock to my system ever. Uh, so it's one of these things where when you're going through that and when you're realizing that you're not just a low man on the totem pole, you're not even on the totem pole. You're looking at the totem pole and the totem pole keeps getting higher and higher when you're in grad school, when you realize, oh my gosh, this is not like a career field where like I can master this thing in three to five years. This is going to be like a 30, 40 year process. Like that's very intimidating, like to be a master of it. It's a very intimidating thing. So, uh, Yes, I, and I've definitely experienced uh, people, like, especially supervisors, being like basically like not caring about your mental health. They're like, yo, we need to keep this professional, you know, take out every personal life characteristic from our interactions. Don't tell me about anything personal. Just keep it professional. And like that said, I go, I give a lot of talks and I give a lot of keynote speeches. And whenever I go to keynote speeches, I do two things. Number one is that I always end every keynote I give with like a five minute talk. And I specifically talk to the, uh, to the grad students as well, or undergrads, but mostly the grad students in the crowd. And then I talk to the supervisors and I explain to the grad students that, uh, what they're going through if they have mental health problems is something that is unfortunately common. And I tell them that a lot of you are going to be told that you can't dress the way you want to dress, you can't act the way you want to act. When I was at Oxford, I used to wear skull t-shirts, I had really long hair, I played an alternative rock band, I was a stand-up comic, I did all kinds of stuff when I was at Oxford. And to be honest with you, it didn't exactly work very well. I was seen as deeply unprofessional and seen as somebody overly familiar because I waved and said hello to people in the hallways. It's ridiculous. Uh, but it's one of these things where culturally in that given department at that given school, that was normal. Uh, do I recommend anybody do that? No, I don't. But it's certainly something where, you know, that was the culture of the department and the culture of that program. So I always talk to the supervisors and say, you have a, res you have a blessed responsibility to be able to work with your graduate students and to set them up for success. But as you set them up for success, you are making their horizons so much broader. And the broader you make their horizons, the more prone they are to anxiety and depression because the difference between their perceived self and their ideal self gets bigger and bigger and bigger because it's not that they're going backwards. Their perceived self is the same, but their ideal self, what they want to accomplish because you're opening their horizons so much, gets so much further and further out that oftentimes that manifests in depression and clinical anxiety. And that's really scary stuff. So supervisors have an obligation to their students, even though they may just see them as slave labor, and which is very, very common, FYI, sorry to tell you, that most grad supervisors like don't care, right? They just don't. They just want you to basically get the work done, right? Just do the work. Like it's the most important thing. Um, and like, frankly, to lack boundaries, which is absurd. But the idea is, is that if your grad school supervisor writes to you uh, on Saturday night at 10 p.m., if you write back to them and say like, my weekends are sacred, I'll write back on Monday. I mean, congratulations on having boundaries, but that makes you come across really, really poorly and unprofessionally if you're a grad student. 
If you're a colleague of the person, then of course you can do whatever you want, right? But this is not a collegial thing. This is like a dictatorship, right? And that's really messed up, but it is also 100% true. And anybody who tells you otherwise is lying. Sorry, right? So in terms of, do I think it's the case for most programs? Yes, I do. And are there ways to detect this or steer clear of the few that are less empowering? Well, it's not the few, it's most. Uh, and are the ways to detect this straight up? Not really. Yes, you can talk to current grad students or past grad students and these things. But remember that this is a very incestuous thing. So if you're talking to a grad student or you're talking to a postdoc of that person, you should just make the assumption that anything you ask is going to get back to the target supervisor. You should just make that assumption. So if you're asking those questions, they're not going to keep it hush hush and keep it a secret or anything like this. And it could go either way, right? It could, I mean, I don't think it would help you. It would help you make your decision, but it wouldn't, you know, make the supervisor think more of you asking questions. Um, does that mean you shouldn't do it? Of course not. That is not what I'm saying. Uh, but that is certainly something that you could do. What I end up finding is it's almost like a romantic relationship. You don't really know that person. There's a great saying about the first several months of a romantic relationship, which is, I'm not dating you. My representative is dating your representative, right? I find that to be hilarious and absurdly true. Um, so it's something where, you know, just like in a romantic relationship, it'll take you some time to get to know the person who they really are. I've certainly experienced that myself in terms of, you know, thinking that supervisors are one way and then you get to know them better and you're like, that's nothing like what I anticipated. And by the way, I'm very confident that people are that way with me as well. Uh, in terms of like, for example, you know, I'm, I'm a, an ambivert in terms of being introverted and extroverted and these sorts of things. I'm an outgoing guy. I love, love, love to help people. It's the reason I have this channel and I still make it even though I don't get paid anything for it. Right. And like ad revenue is like nothing, right? This is not like some hundred thousand, you know, million person channel. Is it, what? No, I do it because I love you guys and I'm, I want you to do well and I want you to be okay. Uh, you mean something to me if you watch this channel and that you spend your time with me. I value you, right? That's the reason that I do this. Um, but uh, anyway, those are my views on sexism, racism, ageism in, in graduate school as well as mental health issues in grad school. All right, guys, I appreciate you so much. Like I said, please do subscribe, like this video, share it on social media. You guys know that I love you. All right, have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.